Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I just want to alert you that we will make a start in a few minutes from now. Thank you so much for attending uh, this webinar. We know you'll find it very informative. So just bear with us for a few minutes and we will make a start. Thank you. Mic test, mic test. Can can everyone hear me? Yes, we can. <laughs> okay. Um, the minister will be there shortly. Thank you. He, one of the ministers are here. The other one is actually going to join in a few minutes. So we'll make a start in a few minutes. Right. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this, uh, the Diaspora Unit uh, webinar series uh, for this week here, where we're going to have some discussions and conversations on the Guyana-Venezuela border controversy. Uh, my name is Rosalinda Rasul. I am the head of the Diaspora Unit here in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and International Cooperation based in Georgetown, Guyana. And I take this opportunity to welcome each and every one of you from across several states, uh, uh, Texas, uh, from Atlanta, uh, from, from Georgia, uh, Washington, D.C. We've got some persons from Maryland and, of course, some persons from California. I do believe that we have one or two persons from Florida and New York also joining us here tonight. 
Thank you so much for taking time out of your schedule and we welcome you to this program. Tonight, we have two very uh, distinguished and eloquent ministers of government who will be sharing with you the accuracy and truth of the Guyana-Venezuela border controversy. And you will note that I've used the word controversy and not the dispute. And you will hear more in the presentations why Guyana is referring to this matter as the controversy. We want to... Um, just a few uh, quick housekeeping rules. We want to ask each and every one of you to keep your microphones muted. So that way we have no uh, feedback or no distraction that will affect our presenters when they're speaking to you on the issue there. So the less interruptions and distraction we have, the better it'll be for the speaker. There will be an opportunity for you to engage with the speakers and to also uh, to ask questions at the designated question and answer segment. I also saw somebody saying that we've got Texas already in the house. So thank you so much, uh, Denise, for gracing us with your presence and with the group from Texas. Thank you so much and welcome to this program. Uh, that being said, we wanna get straight into the program so that we can keep this uh, lively and we can also move along uh, in, with respect to everyone's time. It is my distinct pleasure to introduce as our first speaker, a minister who is uh, working very hard to bring transformation into the public sector. It's a sector where we know the services are so much needed, particularly for every one of you who've come to Guyana and would have had to deal with uh, various ministries and agencies from time to time. So ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome to the floor, the Minister of Public Service, the Honorable Sonia Parag. Ms. Parag, the floor is all yours. And again, I'm gonna ask our sisters to keep their microphone muted. Thank you. Good evening, Rosalinda, and thank you very much. Good evening to my colleague, Dr. Ashni Singh, and to all of you who are on this Zoom this evening, uh, from Texas, from Washington, from Georgia, and any other state that we have on. I thank you for coming on this evening and listening, and thank you for your input whatsoever this evening. So, thank you. So, Minister, you may go ahead with your uh, discussion, then we'll take Dr. Ashley Singh and we'll go into the Q&A. All right. So the reason for us being on this evening is and having the time to be able to spend with you and speak with you is in relation to the Venezuela-Guyana controversy, border controversy, that I'm sure by now you are well acquainted with a lot of the facts and a lot of uh what's been happening back home here at Guyana, as well as what you've been hearing in the news. And it is our job to speak with you, not only as it relates to the facts, but to dispel that, that which is not, or those which are not facts. And to have you understand uh, our Guyana's position on this matter, as well as to listen to any questions that you have and clarify anything that you have you may want to know. And so, you know, I, I, I'm I, glad I'm speaking first, Dr. Ashni Singh, so I don't run the risk of repeating anything. But, um, <laughs> but for us to be able to understand what this controversy is today, we necessarily have to go back to what the historical context of it is. And basically in the latter part of the 1800 and the 19th century, you had Great Britain or the United Kingdom, which had possession of territories here in this part of the hemisphere in the Caribbean and Latin America. And uh, Guyana was a colony at that time, as you would know. And what happened is that Venezuela did not want the United Kingdom to have possession of certain territories. As a matter of fact, Venezuela wanted a portion of land to be, de to be demarcated as theirs, which was a good portion of what Guyana is too. And so the United, they approached the United States to assist them in having this be done. And the United States did not want that to happen. But what in 1897, a treaty of Washington was signed with the United States and United Kingdom. And Basically, the United States twisted the United Kingdom's arm into going to arbitration before a well-put-together tribunal consisting of judges from the UK and the United States. And during that arbitration, you had over 200 hours of uh, presenting or presentations being done, submissions being done in relation to this uh, to the, the borders and the boundaries of the territories. And both parties, the United Kingdom and the United States and Venezuela at that time, 
all of those parties agreed, they consented to whatever the decision of that arbitration be, it would be the full, perfect, and final decision. They all agreed so much so that the arbitral award consisted of those words. And so when the arbitral award was made after detailed submissions and detailed record taking in 1899, the arbitral award was made to demarcate the boundaries of what is Guyana and what is Venezuela. And at that time, the demarcation if of that award is exactly what we know as Guyana and what we know as our map and what Venezuela as what as well as what we know Venezuela to be. Uh, following that, for over 60 decades, Venezuela accepted the demarcation of the boundaries for what it was, what it was from the arbitral award. And there was no issue. There was no issue so much so that they incorporated those boundaries into their laws. And as a result of incorporating in, in, it into their laws, they drew, drew their map to show the borders and the boundaries according to that arbitral award. And so they fully accepted and had no issues from 1899 onwards to 1960 something with the boundaries set out by the arbitral award. Guyana and Venezuela coexisted or British Guyana as it then was coexisted peacefully with Venezuela from that time on. Now approaching when Guyana was approaching independence in 1966 and with, with independence in view in just a few years, in 1961 to 1962, somewhere thereabouts, Venezuela decided that it wanted to, to reopen this issue of the border, of what they thought they should have of Guyana, which is more than two thirds or three quarters of our country. And it was, as I consider it, on a baseless allegation of fraud. Their claim was that a junior attorney in the matter of before the tribunal wrote some letter that he wanted to be published after his death. And this matter came about or was raised by Venezuela some four to five years later. After accepting it, after putting it in their map, after fully, after fully accepting it as their boundary from the, accepting what the arbitral award had as valid. They accepted the arbitral award as being valid. Then they wanted to challenge the validity of the arbitral award. Now, the problem that I have there is that if everyone in this world and every country and every territory in this world was to think like Venezuela and decide that after I have Take, for instance, two neighbors have an issue over a land, or one neighbor has an issue over land. They go to court. They take the other party to court. The court has heard everything that it has to hear in relation to the evidence and the facts, and it makes its determination, and it says, you, sir, you have to get 100 square foot or square feet. You, sir, you have to get 121. This is the boundary that stops here on the north, the south, the east, the west. And that is on your transport. You're both given transport. You agree that this is your boundary. You agree that this is your landmass and this is your space that you're going to occupy, both in the presence of each other. But then Mr. X decides that he's going to wake up tomorrow morning and say, you know what? I think I want a piece of my neighbor's land. I think I want to bring a, take a piece of my neighbor's land and attach it to my own and make my land bigger. And furthermore, I think what happened in that court there the other day was fraud. But I don't have anything to prove fraud. If you allege fraud, you have to prove fraud. I don't have anything to prove fraud. I don't have any evidence, but I'm saying that. If every territory 
was to wake up and think like that in this world, then what would the world be? The world would be in total chaos and confusion. There would be instability in every single, on every single continent, in every single region. And so that is exactly the situation that Venezuela is doing today. It is bullyism. It is greed. It is a distraction from their economic and social failure, uh, the Maduro government's management of that entire disastrous management of that entire country. And so they decide in 1960 something that they were going to wake up and say that this arbitral award was fraudulently granted. Now, the UN Secretary General, through the Geneva Agreement, Guyana had to be independent. You have to be an independent state to be a signatory to the Geneva Agreement. So in 1966, when Guyana became independent, they became a signatory to the Geneva Agreement, which was a significant agreement at that time because it provided for resolutions, it provided for arbitration, it provided for a course of action that can bring about a resolution or a settlement without having to go to court, etc. And so that was the first step, and the U.S. Secretary General decided to explore, not to definitively define and definitely, definitively decide on the matter, but to explore the issue brought up by, by Venezuela. So they went through what is called a good offices process, and for 12 years, the matter was laid to rest. You know, there was talks back and forth, bilateral talks back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. 2017, the matter came up again. And in 2018, Guyana decided, you know what? We need to invoke the authority of the UN Secretary General. And his authority under the Geneva Agreement allows him to direct the course of where a matter can go and, and direct the, the place of where a matter can go. And so under the Gen Geneva Agreement, the UN Secretary General had the right and the authority to refer the matter to the International Court of Justice, which he did. And Guyana has, from the beginning and from the outset, always complied with the law. They have always complied with international law and international principles, diplomacy. And we have always been a country that believes that peace should prevail above anything else. And so our territorial integrity and our territorial sovereignty is threatened. And so we took it, we took the right course of action and as we've always done. So the matters before the International Court of Justice and the government, the Maduro government decided that they will challenge the jurisdiction of the International Court of Justice because they no longer wanted to have the court hear the matter because why? Because they knew they did not have a strong case and a strong foot to stand on in relation to this, to, to the claims that they were making and the allegations that they were making. And so the matter went to the ICJ. The ICJ ruled that it has the jurisdiction to hear the matter and bring a finality to the matter and bring finality to the matter. Maduro, the Maduro government and Maduro decided that he, the Venezuelan government, decided that they were going to disregard that ruling, flout the law flout international principles, and invoke a referendum of their own. Now, it is important for you to understand that a referendum by itself is not unlawful. But where you put in a referendum things that will threaten the peace and threaten the security of a region and threaten the sovereignty and territorial integrity, integrity of another territory, it becomes unlawful. It, it becomes, it has no legal weight. And the referendum, as you know, is set out. And that referendum has five, is asking five questions. Two of those, which will inevitably threaten the stability, threaten the territorial integrity, threaten the peace, security of our country, and by extension, our region. The government, the Venezuela government is asking that the people vote that Guyana, two thirds of the Esequibo region, or the two, -third, two thirds of Guyana, belongs to them. And they 
would annex our territory and incorporate it into their map as their own. That's what they're asking the people to vote on. So we have always, and we strongly believe that we have a strong case before the court, before the ICJ. We have always followed international law. We have always followed and obeyed the law. And we verily believe that Esequibo belongs to us. Matter of fact, we know Esequibo belongs to us. And you know what is even more important is that I am Esequibian. I was born in Esequibo and I grew up in Esequibo for 13 years. So this here, I am not just speaking as a Guyanese, but I'm speaking as an Esequibian too. And I can understand how all of the Esequibians are feeling about this matter right now. And Esequibo belongs to Guyana. All 83,000 square miles of Guyana belongs to Guyana. And we are going to do everything that we can do to protect our borders and protect our territorial integrity. We believe we have a very strong case before the ICJ. We have approached the ICJ for, provis for provisional measures preventing that referendum from going ahead. And that decision will be handed down tomorrow. I'm not sure I'm leaving anything much more for Dr. Ashley Singh to say, but I know he's very eloquent. I know, I know that he can uh, he can expand and and make it sound entirely different from what I said. But <laughs> but in a nutshell, we believe that we are in the right. We, as a matter of fact, I know that I'm in the right. I've since I've been born and I'm growing up. Esequibo belongs to Guyana. Esequibo is a part of our map. And we will not relinquish any part of our country to another territory, especially when we have been granted, when we have been granted that territory and deemed the boundaries of that territory demarcated by a very legal process and by a decision that was made by consent of all the parties. So this evening, I want to thank you for listening to me, and I'm looking forward to the questions and answers. I don't want to, uh, I don't want to sit and belabor you with more of the facts, but those are the facts in a nutshell, and we can we can clarify anything during the questions and answers. Thank you again, Rosalinda. Thank you so much, Minister Parag. We really appreciate that uh, summary of the history that led to the current Guyana-Venezuela border controversy. It is my distinct pleasure now, ladies and gentlemen, to invite to the floor uh, none other than a senior minister in the office of the president with responsibility for finance, the Honorable Dr. Ashley Singh. Dr. Singh, the floor is all yours. Thank you, Th thank you very much, uh, Rosalinda. And let me, of course, thank my cabinet colleague, Minister Sonia Farag, for that very comprehensive presentation that she just gave. And most importantly, let me thank all of our dear Guyanese brothers and sisters who have joined on this call, irrespective of where you're joining from. I gather that we have um, members of the diaspora from a number of the states of the United States of America. I'm told we have the diaspora from Georgia, from Texas, from California, and uh, likely a number of other states across the USA, and indeed, uh, possibly beyond. So thank you very much for joining. And Thank you very much for um, your continued close engagement with the land of your birth and in many cases, the land of your birth and infant nurture. The Guyanese diaspora over the years has maintained an extremely co close connection with their homeland have returned frequently, have still have, in many cases, family connections here, have stayed in touch with news and developments in Guyana over the years, have members of the Guyanese diaspora have 
advocated Guyana's interests at various points in our country's history, particularly some of the more critical points in our country's history. And I'm going back all the way to independence and pre-independence and all of the time that would have elapsed since then. And so we consider the Guyanese diaspora to be an extremely important stakeholder in all matters of national importance. And it is for this reason that we have launched this series of engagements with the diaspora, with the objective of ensuring that our diaspora remains fully informed and engaged, has an opportunity to ask us any questions that you might have, and indeed ensure that you are yourselves armed and equipped to speak authoritatively on this matter should the necessity or opportunity arise. Now, Minister Parag has already shared with you, like I said, a comprehensive history of the matter. And indeed, like she said, leaving me very modest room to add, uh, elaborate, or uh, expand. I wish very quickly to reiterate perhaps two or three key and salient points, which you would have heard from her already. But I repeat them only for emphasis and clarity. I believe she was, of course, completely and perfectly clear, but I repeat them for emphasis and repetition sometimes does indeed aid or reinforce clarity. The first is that the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland, the colonial power responsible for what was then known as British Guyana, entered into an agreement with Venezuela undertaking to settle the matter of the border between Venezuela, this is in the 1897 Washington Treaty, under which the United States, the United Kingdom and Venezuela agreed to an arbitral proceeding from which the parties agreed will emerge a full, final and perfect settlement of the border between the two countries. I will not repeat all of the details, but this led to an award in 1899 that established the border between British Guyana, as it was then known, and Venezuela. And that is the border that all of us have come to know that is the border that has defined the maps of Venezuela and Guyana known around the world. And that is the border that continues to constitute Guyana's westernmost border up to today. Like Minister Parag said, Venezuela enshrined that agreement into their domestic law, drew official maps and published official maps for decades, entered into other bilateral treaties on their borders, including a border agreement with Brazil that reinforced and reiterated the trijunction point between Guyana and by, between British Guyana, Venezuela, and Brazil. As you know, those three countries meet at a point called the trijunction point. The location of that trijunction point was reaffirmed and reiterated and reconfirmed by a border treaty entered into between Venezuela and Brazil in 1928. And Venezuela continued to accept and recognize this border as binding and authoritative for six decades. Reopened the controversy or introduced controversy as Guyana was approaching independence. And that then led to the process that we have been undertaking since we became an independent nation, navigating various 
stages and phases of efforts to mediate the UN Good Offices process, etc., leading ultimately to the United Nations Secretary General in February 2018 saying that the appropriate forum to resolve this matter is, in, is now the International Court of Justice, leading subsequently in 2018 to Guyana submitting the matter to the International Court of Justice, and here we are today. The substantive matter is still before the International Court of Justice. Venezuela is seeking to preempt the ruling, the, the rulings that will eventually emerge from the International Court of Justice by a provocative and hostile referendum that asks questions that suggest a design that would be contrary to international law and contrary to peaceful and fraternal relations between neighboring states. Guyana finds that proposed referendum repugnant and has gone to the International Court of Justice with, with a, an application for specific provisional measures in relation to the said re referendum. I repeat those points only for emphasis. Minister Parag articulated them in much greater detail. She having done so, I will turn my attention instead to, so you, you have the history, we'd be happy to go back to any question on the history. But Minister Parag, having articulated the history so comprehensive in terms of how we got to where we are, I will instead turn my attention to two other points that I consider important to mention. The first is that Guyana is not standing alone in relation to this matter. This is not a position that Guyana as a solitary member of the international community is taking. This is in fact a position on which Guyana has enjoyed long-standing regional hemispheric and global solidarity. Excuse me for one minute. My, my apologies. I was hearing a noise that could potentially interfere with the transmission. So I've asked for them to investigate what that noise was. So I was saying that Guyana's position has enjoyed long-standing regional, hemispheric, and global solidarity. Guyana is not alone in its position in relation to this matter. And I want to read, and I will read, I will not paraphrase, I will not translate into my own interpretation, I will read for you three international statements made within the last month or so that illustrate the strength of the international solidarity that Guyana enjoys on this matter. The first is a statement by our most immediate neighbors and our dear and long-standing friends in the Caribbean community. You know, as you know, Guyana was a founding member state of the Caribbean community, its precursor, the Caribbean Free Trade Area, CARIFTA. And many of you would know, of course, of the West Indian Federation that even further predated CARIFTA. Every single conference of the CARICOM heads of government has issued a press release at the end of that conference. And that press release has included a section on the Guyana-Venezuela matter, every single CARICOM heads of government countries. As recently as the 25th of October, 2023, 
just about a month ago. CARICOM heads of government issued the following statement, and I quote, it's headed statement by the Caribbean community on the Ghana-Venezuela border controversy, and it reads as follows. The Caribbean community notes the decision of the Venezuelan National Assembly to conduct a popular referendum on defending Venezuela's claim of Essequibo. CARICOM further notes that two of the questions approved to be posed in the referendum, if answered in the affirmative, would authorize the government of the Bolivarian Republic of Venezuela to embark on the annexation of territory, which constitutes part of the cooperative republic, and to create a state within Venezuela known as Guyana Essequibo. CARICOM reaffirms that international law strictly prohibits the government of one state from unilaterally seizing, annexing, or incorporating the territory of another state. An affirmative vote, as aforesaid, opens the door to the possible violation of this fundamental tenet of international law. It is to be emphasized that the land and water in question, the Essequibo region of Guyana, comprises more than two-thirds of the whole of Guyana itself. CARICOM notes that the language of two questions approved to be posed in the referendum seeks an affirmation and implementation of Venezuela's stance on the issue, in quotes, by all means according to with the law, close quotes. It is open to reasonable persons to conclude that the phrase, by all means, includes means of force or war. CARICOM earnestly hopes that Venezuela is not raising the prospect of using force or military means to get its own way in this controversy over territory. After all, it has been the long-standing position of Latin American and Caribbean countries including Venezuela, that our region must remain a zone of peace. Meanwhile, CARICOM insists that the referendum posed by Venezuela has no validity, bearing, or standing in international law in relation to this controversy. This referendum is a purely domestic construct, my apologies, this referendum is a purely domestic construct, but its summary effect is likely to undermine peace, tranquility, security, and more in our region. CARICOM reiterates its support for the judicial process and expresses the hope that Venezuela will engage fully in that process before the International Court of Justice, which has determined that it has the jurisdiction in the case brought before it to determine the validity of the 1899 arbitral award which Venezuela questions. The court's final decision will ensure a resolution that is peaceful, equitable, and in accordance with international law. I will now read, secondly for you, a statement by the General Secretariat of the Organization of American States. And the OAS, as you know, is a hemispheric organization based in Washington, DC. And its membership comprises all of the member states of the American continent, from Canada in the north, to Argentina in the south, and everybody in between all of the member states of North America, Central America, and South America, headquartered, as I said, in Washington, D.C. Statement by the OAS General Secretariat on recent events regarding the Guyana-Venezuela dispute, 23rd of September, 2023. And I quote, on September 21st, 2023, the regime of Venezuela's National Assembly unanimously agreed to call a national public consultation so that the people strengthen the defense, in quotes, 
so that the people strengthen the defense and, again in quotes, the inalienable rights of Venezuela. Both of those phrases are direct quotes from the resolution that emerged from the Venezuela's National Assembly. Those are not the language of the OAS. And it continues over the territorial dispute with Guyana. We condemn this improper use of a referendum because it is illegal according to the 1966 Geneva Agreement and because similar misuses of this instrument have served as a pretext in the recent past to try to justify the worst actions between states, including the crime of aggression. The General Secretariat of the Organization of American States reiterates that Venezuela and Guyana share the responsibility of resolving their dispute in the spirit of good neighborliness and in accordance with international law and the Geneva Agreement to seek peaceful solutions to the territorial dispute. Furthermore, the OAS General Secretariat continues to support the Cooperative Republic of Guyana's sovereign right to practice its franchise on its established and appurtenant maritime area in accordance with international law and the principles of the United Nations. The OAS Secretariat objects to Venezuela's encroachment on Guyana's sovereignty and territorial rights through intimidatory and unfounded statements that fail to respect international conventions and the 1899 Arbitral Award, for which the latter is presently under judicial review at the International Court of Justice. End of quote in relation to the OAS, the OAS's statement on the matter. Thirdly, I will read for you a statement by the Commonwealth Secretary General. The Commonwealth, as you will know, comprises the United Kingdom and its former colonies, including Canada, Australia, New Zealand, India, and of course, the member states of the Caribbean. The Commonwealth, as you know, the Commonwealth Secretariat, as you know, is housed and hosted by the United Kingdom in Marlow House on Pall Mall in London. I will, as I said, now read for you the Commonwealth Secretary General statement dated 1st of November 2023. The Commonwealth Secretary General, the Right Honorable Patricia Scotland, King's Council, has expressed deep concern at the 21st September decision of the Venezuelan National Assembly to undertake a referendum on the status of the Essequibo region, part of the sovereign territory of the government of the Cooperative Republic of Guyana. Speaking on the escalation, the Secretary General said, and I quote, the Commonwealth stands with the government and people of Guyana and with our partners in CARICOM in expressing our concern over the questions in the planned referendum. And the Commonwealth continues to stand for the rule of law and reaffirms its firm and steadfast support for the maintenance and preservation of the sovereign and territorial integrity of Guyana and the unobstructive exercise of its rights to develop the entirety of its territory for the benefit of its people. The five questions approved by the National Electoral Council of Venezuela to be included in the referendum undermine Guyana's territorial integrity and sovereignty, and their intent is contrary to international law. Question five proposes the creation of a Venezuelan state of Guyana, of Guyana Essequibo, and an accelerated plan for giving Venezuelan citizenship and identity cards to the Guyanese population. International law prohibits the seizure and annexation by one country of the territory of another. 
The language in these questions contributes to heightened tension and is a threat to peace and stability in a member state of our Commonwealth family and indeed in the wider Caribbean region. At the last meeting of the Commonwealth Ministerial Group on Guyana, held on 17th September 2023, the group, open quotes, reaffirmed its unwavering support for the judicial process underway before the International Court of Justice, chosen by the Secretary General of the United Nations under the 1966 Geneva Agreement. And the group continues to encourage Venezuela to participate in the said process, end of quote. And the Commonwealth Secretary General's statement concludes as follows. The International Court of Justice determined in April of this year that it had legal jurisdiction over this long-standing issue. And the Commonwealth supports the use of the ICJ to adjudicate on the matter. The referendum goes against the spirit of peaceful dispute resolution. I shared with you, and I took the time to read, and not to summarize or paraphrase in my own or anybody else's language, those statements, because of the wide membership of those international hemispheric and regional organizations, and because of the remarkable clarity with which these various international organizations spoke. But let me go further and say that the solidarity that Guyana enjoys with those international hemispheric and regional and sub-regional organizations and the member states that comprise their these organizations, these international organizations. Let me go further and say that domestically, we have similar, indeed identical, and perhaps even stronger unanimity and national solidarity in relation to this matter. What do I mean by that? Throughout the history of independent Guyana, successive governments of Guyana, irrespective of which political party has formed the government and which political party constitutes the opposition, throughout the history of independent Guyana, there has been national cross-party solidarity on this matter. Whether it is the pre-1992 government of the People's National Congress, a period during which the People's Progressive Party would have been in opposition, the 1992 to 2015 People's Progressive Party government, a period during which the PNC and its subsequent coalitions and alliances would have formed the opposition. The 2015 to 2020 APNU AFC government during which the PPP would have been in opposition. Or the post-2020 the post People's Progressive Party government with the APNU AFC in opposition. Irrespective of which one of those periods one might be referring to, Every single government and opposition in independent Guyana has maintained unanimous solidarity on this matter. There is political unanimity and unshakable solidarity. In fact, on the 25th of October 2023, a joint statement was issued by His Excellency, the President of Guyana, Dr. Mohammed Irfan Ali, and 
the leader of the opposition, the Honorable Mr. Aubrey Norton, in relation to this specific matter. And the president and the leader of the opposition spoke with one voice to denounce this unlawful intimidatory and completely reprehensible and unacceptable step being taken by our neighbors to the West. I will not read the joint statement issued by the president and the opposition leader. It is a little bit longer and as you can well imagine, a little bit more expansive. It's available online, but I'd be happy to read it or sections of it if you would like me to. Furthermore, the parliamentary parties of Guyana with the People's Progressive Party sitting on the government benches and the APNU AFC sitting in the opposition benches came together on the 6th of November 2023 and passed resolution number 66 of the 12th Parliament of Guyana in its first session. 2020 to 2023, sitting as the National Assembly of Guyana. And resolution number 66, dated the 6th of November 2023, is also a little bit longer than the statements I previously read. This too is available online. But I will perhaps just read the resolved the be it what we call in parliamentary language, the be it resolved clauses. So that you have a sense of what the parliamentary parties together, again speaking with one voice, what the national parliamentary parties of the National Assembly of Guyana said in resolution number 66. The National Assembly unanimously resolved that the said National Assembly, one, affirms the sovereignty and territorial integrity of the state of the Cooperative Republic of Guyana. Two, reaffirms its recognition and acceptance of the 1899 Arbitral Award as a full, perfect, and final settlement of the boundary between Guyana and Venezuela. And Article 4.2 of the 1966 Geneva Agreement as giving the mandate to the United Nations Secretary General to select the means of resolving the controversy. Three, denounces as provocative, unlawful, void, and of no international legal effect the purported referendum in Venezuela that is scheduled for December 3rd, 2023. Four, supports the government in its pursuit to ensure a peaceful and lawful resolution of the controversy before the International Court of Justice and rejects the proposal to return to any form of dialogue with Venezuela on the controversy outside of the process before the court. Five, supports government's formal approach for the urgent protection of the International Court of Justice with the filing with the court of a request for provisional measures for an order preventing Venezuela from taking any action to seize, acquire, or encroach upon, or assert, or exercise sovereignty over the Essequibo region, or any other part of Guyana's national territory pending the court's final determination of the validity of the arbitral award. Six calls for deepening of engagements amongst all national stakeholders on issues relating to the sovereignty and territorial integrity of the Cooperative Republic of Guyana, particularly within the context of the meetings of the Bipartisan Ministerial Advisory Committee on the Guyana-Venezuela controversy. Seven, encourages the citizens of Venezuela, oh, my apologies, encourages the citizens of Guyana to remain fully engaged on developments surrounding the controversy. Eight, expresses its appreciation to the partners and friends of the Cooperative Republic of Guyana for their support and expressions of affirmation of the sovereignty and territorial integrity of Guyana passed by the National Assembly of Guyana on Monday, 6th November, 2023. 
Now, my dear Guyanese brothers and sisters, I took the time to read those. I know you can search on the internet and find these resources quite easily yourself. And I encourage you so to do. But I know too that there's a vast volume of literature available on the internet and online. And I wanted to zero in on these particular statements made internationally to make the point that there is vast and wide international solidarity with Guyana on this matter. We're not standing alone. And secondly, that the solidarity amongst the Guyanese people, irrespective of where one might stand on the domestic political spectrum, when it comes to questions in relation to the sovereignty and territorial integrity of our beloved Guyana, we stand together as Guyanese citizens, proud of, proud of our country and of our country's vast and rich legacy and beautiful history, proud of the unity that we are able to muster when it comes to the matters, the most important matters of national importance, and standing together prepared to defend our country alongside all of our international friends. I will stop there because I want more particularly to give you an opportunity to ask questions. I trust that we've been sufficiently clear, but and it's a parag in relation to the history of the matter and myself in relation to the international domestic solidarity on this issue. I would be happy, as would Minister Parag, we would be happy to take any questions that you might have in relation to this matter. Thank you very much, and you've been a very patient um, uh, audience uh, on this call. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Ashin Singh. We are uh, very much um, enlightened by your very, um, very, very insightful presentation. I know it's quite a lot of information for our diaspora across the combined states, and where we hope that you also um, would would have found this enlightening. Now, this is a section where we'll give you an opportunity to interface directly with our two key speakers. If you have any question, please use the raise hand button that's at the bottom of your screen to indicate that you want to speak and we will give you an opportunity to do so. For those persons who may be shy and not want to, to speak, you have an opportunity also to type your questions in the chat box and we will read them out during the course of this webinar uh, to our speakers. If you want your question to be addressed by either or, you can indicate so, or you can just specifically state which one of the speakers you wanted to just make it an open floor question. Additionally, we're going to ask persons on the call to put your contact details in the chat box so we can provide information uh, to you after this call. In the previous uh, webinars, we've had persons who ask us for a recording of this year. So they have the information, they have the facts uh, at their disposal. And even afterwards, so we can send you updates and critical information that'll be very helpful uh, to you because we know you're very much interested in what's going on in Guyana. So again, please put your contact details, your name, an email address and a WhatsApp number so we can be in touch with you and we'll go straight into the question. So we have Mr. Wendell Jackson. You may ask your question, sir. Ah, uh, hello, wonderful humans. I mean, I've got quite a few questions. I am trapped in Tennessee. Okay, so stuff I've been learning off the internet. Um, so is it about these people like the CIA behind the scenes to uh, effect regime change? So they want to put a base on Guyanese soil is like, I mean, you know, you know, it's all about what they call um, the the colonizers just trying to control everything, like you know, like they do in Haiti, how they don't want to release those people because they have all these minerals. They found more minerals other than oil. They want to get their hands on. You know, that kind of thing. So yeah, is it is it that that's what it is? You know, except, you know, saying hey. You know, we set regime change because the number of Venezuelans in the US, you know, they're like, hey, and I think they're one of the places that don't have what they call um, a central bank. I, I'm, you know, I, I don't mean to get anybody lost, but just like they lie, like, you know, the weapons of mass destruction, they go to the United Nations, they've got 
The weapons of mass destruction in the north, south, east, and west. They had to walk that back eventually. So it's good, like we're going to find out like five, ten years from now that they've been manipulating us behind the scenes to, for their benefit. So that's, I guess, it's an open floor question. Anybody can answer. Not just the two, you know. Anybody. So would you like me to go first or... Doesn't matter. This, go ahead, uh, Mr. So, uh, Rosalinda? Would, yes, go ahead, I... Minister. Um, Mr. Jackson, could you move your microphone in the meantime? Thank you. Yes, thank you. Go ahead, Minister. So, so thank you very much, um, Mr. Jackson, for your question. Let me say that we as a government have been very consistent in speaking cautiously on this matter. And for obvious reasons, in matters of international relations, one has to be extremely careful about the language that one uses. And I don't want to engage in conspiracy theories and speculation. What I will say is that this matter is not a new matter. Venezuela's agitation in relation to Essequibo long predates Guyana's discovery of oil. And in fact, as you would have heard when Minister Parag outlined the history, even predated by a very short period, predated Guyana's political independence. And so I would hesitate to suggest, obviously, the discovery of oil makes the basin a lot more attractive and perhaps inspires others a little bit more to have designs on ownership. But the fact of the matter is that the Venezuelan manufactured controversy predated the discovery of oil in Guyana's offshore waters. And secondly, I want to say clearly and unequivocally, and you no doubt would have been following the news uh, emanating out of Guyana. I want to say clearly and unequivocally that we have very, very good relations with the largest countries in our hemisphere and a number of other extremely influential countries around the world. And those relations go beyond mere diplomatic platitudes and friendly relations. They go beyond traditional development cooperation. They go beyond collaborating on major issues of international interest. They include defense cooperation. And you would have seen in recent days and weeks and the manifest the moment, you would have the moment. I don't mean to sound rude. Um, if you would give somebody else an opportunity to ask a question, that would be great. Sorry, we didn't get a minister continue. We, we didn't just, uh, sorry, I'm not sure what he asked here, but go ahead, Minister. Sorry about that interruption. I was, I was saying that you would have seen a number of press reports reinforcing the very close defense cooperation that we enjoy with friendly nations, both in our hemisphere 
and elsewhere. Thank you very much. All right, thank you so much, Minister. Uh, we'll now take the question from Mr. Dwayne Barnwell. Yeah, good evening, everyone. Um, I think I've listened to, to, to this, and, and my concern is that a lot of this is an emotional plea or an emotional argument being made. Um, and I don't think we're addressing the elephant in the room, which I think we have to look at. Guyana is a threat to Venezuela. And strictly from the point of view of Venezuela is part of OPEC. OPEC has a way of turning on and off the, the spigot on oil. And currently the projection for Guyana is about 1.3 million barrels of oil per day is what Guyana is projected to, to, to get to. Um, and so what I, I mean, what, what, what we need to address is, is, is deeper than just, I don't think it's just coincidence that at this point, Venezuela just decides we're just going to claim this, this territory because if you look at the territory they're claiming, it's all the oil that Guyana has. So what is Guyana doing besides making these pleas to these courts to prepare themselves if and should an actual invasion happen across that border? Um, that's really the question. Um, and looking at the timing, it's very convenient that the world is kind of distracted. You have Russia and Ukraine dealing with their situation. You have the Middle East with Israel and, and Palestinians dealing with their, their situation. So I think Venezuela is looking at this as like a, an opportune time with the backing of Russia. Why not take it? Why not take and control the oil? Because then you actually control the, the Venezuela's destiny. They're, they're essentially controlling their destiny. That's part one of my question. The second thing is, why is Guyana letting in all these Venezuelans and just automatically giving these people citizenship? How we know that they're not soldiers or, or military personnel being strategically positioned in certain areas that should and when, if anything happens, these people just, they're already in position. They don't have to come across the border. They're already in the country. So I hope you can um, shed some light on that. Um, I mean, I don't want to go too much further than that, but I hope you can shed some light on those two points, please. Thank you all for right, that. So, go ahead, Minister. All right. So first of all, you said let's address the elephant in the room, which is um, Venezuela is not just waking up one day and deciding. Now, my uh, when I made that point, it was in relation to potential instability being caused by a very vexatious and frivolous and baseless allegation being made by a territory and what that can what that means for the rest of the world now uh whatever venezuela's motivation might be i address the issue of greed and that's not just land grabbing or territory grabbing it may very well be that because our the Esquibo region has been, and, and that's a, a very a very resourceful region in terms of oil, that that could be a very reason that they want Esequibo. And, uh, and again, a distraction from their economic and social failure. And I think those, it's a combination. It's a combination of things, driving forces that has caused them to, that is making them do this. But what, what we know, is that we have, and I've said this before, we are committed to diplomacy. We're committed to peace. We're committing to obeying the laws, whether it be domestic laws or international laws. And by virtue of those, that, diplo that diplomatic or diplomacy channel, Guyana is a signatory to many treaties with several territories. And when you're a signatory to these treaties, it's not just because you want to be placed and positioned on a treaty to say that I've arrived, I'm a country to be recognized. No, it's for several different reasons. And one of those reasons, as Dr. Ashni Singh would have stated before, is for defense cooperation, it's for regional security, it's for food security, it's for energy, it's for different reasons. And so we expect when you sign on any territory and if any ter territory is facing what we're facing today with Venezuela, 
that those treaties would become effective in the sense that we invoke a diplomacy channel whereby our partners and our international community will rally for what is right. And Guyana has believed, we believe that we've always been in the right where this matter is concerned. And we have a very strong case before the ICJ in relation to our territory. And so we believe that the international community is very supportive of us for that reason, as well as we are a signatory to all of these treaties that enables us to get the assistance from those territories. So we are working very strongly and very strategically with our international partners to be able to protect our borders. Now, the president has His Excellency Dr. Mohamed Irfan Ali on several occasions at several, several different forums have stated that we will not take anything. We will not take anything for granted. We will prepare ourselves for any eventualities. And it's not just while we are taking the legal course as we should, and, and we believe we should always do the legal and right thing. We also will prepare for anything that is to come or anything that may be potential, uh, be a potential threat to our borders. So in recent times, as in maybe a day or two ago, the newspapers over here and social media would have carried the United States having a, a, a troop come in and they were in working in collaboration with the Guyana Defense Force. Now that's not, that's not a secret that has been made public in relation to the news and as well as social media. And as I said, we've been working strategically to protect our borders with the international community. Um, if I am to answer your second question now, as it relates to the Venezuelans coming into Guyana, now a lot of, in the Caribbean, as well as Latin America, there's over 10 million Venezuelans that have flee that that are fleeing from Venezuela because of the economic and social circumstances. Now, Guyana, as I said, is signatory to the UN Charter. They are signatory to many other treaties, and these treaties have enshrined in them certain conditions, certain terms, certain principles upon which we will all stand on. And so we will follow those principles, whether it be Venezuelans, whether it be Brazilians, whether it be some other um some other some other migrants, but a lot of those persons coming to Guyana are Guyanese. Those are people who would have left in the 70s, the 80s, and built a life in Venezuela and have returned to Guyana. So a lot of that has been Guyanese. And I'm not, I will not speak as to citizenship because I don't believe that that is accurate. But, um, but as I said, we have embraced everyone and we've embraced them based on our commitment to these treaties, we have embraced people because of the fact that a lot of them are Guyanese. But that is not to say that we will not put systems in place to monitor any operatives that we have in our communities. So I hope that I have answered your question somewhat and I will hand over to Dr. Ashley Singh if you have any more clarity, if you need any more clarity on your questions. I guess Thanks. just... Is is there no exceptions could be made at a time when there's a sovereign there's a there's a threat to the sovereignty of Guyana that you waive or you make exceptions to your your allotment of migrants or or your allotments of of people seeking economic um help I, I'm not, I'm just looking at it I mean Guyana is under duress at this point and if we I'm I'm not sure that's the right group of people to 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 just let in, but I mean I'm here, they're there, so. All right, the minister, you're muted. Right, see, you may want to unmute. There you. There you go. Okay, you can you can hear me now, right? Right. Yeah. No, I, well, thank you very much, Mr. Barnwell, for your question. I, I mean, you raised a number of important points, and you are absolutely correct when you said that this isn't just an emotional issue. I agree with you; are absolutely correct. 
it isn't just an emotional issue and cannot only be argued on emotional grounds. And you are absolutely correct that there are strong vested interests here, including the fact that Esipibo is a, as, as Minister Parag said, is a resource rich uh, uh, continent, region. Um, now, even more so with the discovery of oil. So you're, abs I mean, you're absolutely correct in that regard, that the, the intent, Venez the Venezuelan intent in relation to, to Esequibo is only further reinforced by the reality that there's oil uh, in Esequibo. So in that regard, you're absolutely, absolutely correct. I wouldn't disagree with you at all. Um, you, cite you cited some numbers. You made the point, of course, that by 2027, we'll be producing about 1.3 million barrels of oil per, per day, um, 1.2 million barrels of oil per day, thereabouts. Um, I, I will say that, and not to take away from that argument, because like I said, I agree and we agree fully with you that the discovery of oil in, Esquib in, in, the, in the waters off of the Escobo coast certainly does, like, I don't want to repeat myself, but I agree with you in that regard. But just as a point to note, that if you were to consider the relativities here, Guyana's proven oil reserves right now amount to 11 billion barrels of oil. Venezuela's total proven oil reserves amount to 300 billion barrels of oil. So Venezuela's oil dwarfs dwarfs Guyana's proven oil reserves to date. Now, of course, our exploration is ongoing. We anticipate that we'll find more. We certainly hope that we'll find more. But I just wanted to make the point that if you are to consider the relativities, Venezuela already has a vast resource that is several times larger than ours. And that resource has been mismanaged and squandered to the point now where Venezuela is in the state that it currently is in. And the world has been seeing that and will form certain unavoidable conclusions in relation to that. And the Venezuelan people have been seeing that too and will form unavoidable conclusions in relation to, in relation to that. But I don't cite that relativity to take away from the point that you make, because I agree with you that the discovery of oil, no doubt, up, will up the stakes in this matter. Dr. Singh, um, I'm not... Sure. This is Sure. It's not about how much oil Venezuela has, right? Uh, what I'm looking at is, it's the fact that OPEC can turn on and off oil to regulate the price. OPEC is the only cartel that can literally manipulate the price of oil in the world market. With the amount of oil that Guyana will potentially put on the market at any time, my concern is that that's the thing that, OPEC, that threatens Venezuela because ultimately Venezuela is being part of OPEC benefits when OPEC decides to cut production and the price of oil goes up. Now, if Guyana can offset 1.3 million barrels from OPEC, if OPEC decides to cut 1.3 million barrels of oil per day, and Guyana by itself, that little country can, oh, we can turn that on and balance the world market, then OPEC, it doesn't is. Have, OPEC does not have that power anymore that they used, that they used or may have, used, may have had. So what I'm, I guess the point I'm making is, to me, that's the point that Venezuela is trying to stifle. It's not the fact that they have all that oil sitting in the ground and it's and it's not able to come out of the ground. It's the fact that they don't have, they, they have the ability to cut off um, Guyana's ability to turn that oil on. And the timing, again, if when Guyana gets to that point that it becomes an economic superpower, if it does, then Venezuela can't move on Guyana at that point. So you might as well attack Guyana when it's at its weakest point, which is right now. So, so that's how I see this geopolitical. I don't want to. Sorry, Mr. B Mr. Bar, I don't want to cut you. But we do want. We do want to give a number of other people a chance to speak. Perhaps you didn't hear me when I said 
I agree with you in relation to the point that you made. So, and I didn't consider it necessary to repeat what you said because I expressed my agreement with it. You raised a second point in relation to, um, to migrants and the granting of citizens and Minister Parag has already addressed that. I will only say to you that Guyanese citizenship is only being granted to those who demonstrate that they're entitled to it under our constitution. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you so much, um, Minister, for that answer. And I'll come back to the citizenship in the closing remarks um, of this year. We'll go on to the other qu uh, persons who've raised their hand. Mr. Dalton, you may proceed with your yes. question. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I have several questions uh, that I that I want to ask, and I try to get to them as quickly as possible. One of the things that um, seems annoying to me, we have a border dispute with Venezuela, as you guys outlined it, and outlined it, and this has been going on for decades, if not generations. Um, because I remember since in school, the Venezuelans had their map which included Venice, um, uh, Sucubo, and the Pyrenees land reclamation. I recall that the Venezuelan border, Chavez, the, who now passed away at one time as a captain in the um, Venezuelan army, and he used to shout all explicit things we do with Guyana when they, when they conquer us. But the thing is, I saw clips whereby we had the Jagdio talking to negotiating with Maduro about the use and partnership of the Orinoco. Uh, two things here. Um, as bad as Maduro be, Maduro went and got a referendum from the people of Venezuela to enforce what he wants to do, right? Here we have our leader. I was, well, I was, he's still a leader in the country, basically, um, negotiating with a state that wants to encroach on our territorial and integrity and our sovereignty, the use of part of our country, of our waterways. Venezuela doesn't need our waterways. Venezuela has hundreds of miles of waterways. Why did Jaguar find it necessary to go to offer Maduro the use of the Orinoco and parts of his waterways, which would also include perhaps the usage and the extraction of the minerals and all that it might entail there. That's one. Without 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 the um okay from parliament and without a referendum from the Guyanese people. I find that very, very disturbing. The other thing that I want to talk about. And I know that you and the minister tap lightly in it when you talk about um, the citizenship. Um, we've seen where the Guyanas, where the Venezuelans were coming over, and they would just go up to the police and say, well, oh, uh, my grandfather was a Guyanese, and they just allowed them to pass. The police allowed them pa to pass. There were videos with that, that we've seen this, fortunately or unfortunately, this is not 1970 something. We are in 2023. Somebody could get a phone and we see instantaneously what is happening, not only in Guyana, but around the world. And we see these things as it, as it occurs, live and direct, right? But my question is, as a follow up and addendum to what the guy asked about, how do we validate? And I know it was kind of glossed over. Yeah, you know, we are we vetting them. How do we vet these people? to make sure that you don't have military operatives from the Venezuelan army posing as migrants and, and, and disenfranchised Venezuelans who is seeking to come into our country, along with criminalistic elements. We have already seen popping up within the Guyanese society, whereby Venezuelans come in and entreating Guyanese um, citizens, and to some extent, also attacking people in the military that are that the, our, our soldiers. Which brings me to the third point in terms of morale. How 
I have yet to see these people being charged that violating the um, civil rights of our men, of the men in uniform, men and women in uniform, um, whether they're Venezuelan operatives or whether they're even Guyanese um, people that may be of a certain political persuasion. I'm yet to see them brought before the court. And this would hinge a lot on the um on the not the morality on the um the word is missing it on the the state of affair and readiness of our soldiers to go and fight and defend our country knowing fully well that our people are are fully behind them. We have to treat our people, our servicemen, with respect and with integrity. And the laws of Guyana and the organs of the laws of Guyana, being the police force and the judiciary system, must be there to enforce that. Um, last but not least, you mentioned, about, uh, you, you mentioned where uh, there are certain treaties and so on that we follow as a nation. And therefore, you extend that to Venezuela also. How didn't we, I, I would like to bring to your attention that when it came to the aspect of the Haitians, we did not see a similar olive leaf extended to them, right? The Haitians were treated with a different matter. And we have to be, the government of Guyana needs to be persistent in terms of its policies and what is good for Peter has to be good for Paul too, right? We are at a stage of our history where we're in imminent danger of being invaded. This reminds me of the Greek mythology of Perseus, not Perseus, of the, um, of the Trojan horse. When they brought the Trojan horse into the country while they were asleep, the soldiers just went to the gate and they they conquered them and, and they killed the people, the, the enemies. Now, this, to my mind, we are opening our country to our enemies. All right. Mr. I am Dunn not sure that you have everything intact in place of vetting these people that are coming in my country. Okay. You Mr. Dalton, sorry to that. Sorry to interrupt you, but we would like you to truncate your questions because we have others on the call and we want to give them enough time. So thank you for those. Thank yeah, you for I'm those. Finished. Yes, thank you so much for those questions. And again, I'm going to ask persons uh, to mute your microphone. Even if you're asking a question or any background noise, we will still ask you to mute your background noise if just there's a television on or something or another device because we're still getting that feedback. So we really would appreciate that. And, and we would be grateful if questions can keep your question uh, succinct and to the point so we can get the answers, get as many people to participate as possible. Um, does anybody want to, to go first on this one here, Minister? On any one of the issues there. Sure. Shall I go? Well, I'm going to try to be brief because I see lots of other hands raised. Um, so thank you very much. Was it Mr. Dalton? Is that correct? Yes. So, Right. So thank you very much, Mr. Dalton, for your comments. Let me say definitively that this point that you made about the vice president making an offer has already been answered publicly by the vice president at a recent press conference. And as a matter of fact, as was confirmed by the Venezuelan memorandum that was submitted to the International Court of Justice recently, evidence was produced not by Guyana, not by Guyana or not by Vice President Jack Dio. The Venezuelan said to the International Court of Justice that that offer that you are referring to was made prior to 1992 before the People's Progressive Party came into government. And so I urge you to examine the Venezuelan submission, and I urge you to, to listen to, President, to, Vice, to the former President Jagdeo's recent press conference, where he addressed that matter, referring to the Venezuelan memorandum, which, con which indicated, in fact, that the alleged offer, the offer that is being referred to, was not, in fact, made by him, was made prior, not only to him assuming the presidency, but prior to 
him took to the People's Progressive Party came in, came, coming into government in 1992. Secondly, I want to make the following point, and I'm going to reiterate it. This is not a matter for partisan, for anybody in Guyana or connected to Guyana to play a partisan blame game. And to, uh, and, and, to, uh, 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 and to convey, in fact, partisanship. Every government, I'm not going to repeat what I said earlier, every single government and opposition has spoken in a unified manner in this matter. Because it's a matter that affects all of us. It's a matter that goes to the core of our national interest. Thirdly, I want to say to you that the same respect that you expressed for the men and women in uniform is shared certainly by our government and I believe by everybody in Guyana. Our men and women in uniform have been working hard always, have demonstrated the highest level of commitment. And let me go further and say that we have confidence that the men and women in uniform, whether military or, as you know, the, the, the immigration service falls under the police force, are professionals. And they are doing their jobs at the various ports of entry and at other points where people are crossing the border and coming into Ghana, the same police men and women to whom you referred and who you claim to have high respect for and for whom this government has the highest of respect for, they are doing the best possible job, including as far as is practicable and possible, screening those who enter Ghana or who have come into Ghana. And I can assure you that Guyanese citizenship is not being extended in a capricious, wild, or reckless manner. And nobody can pull up a video and say their grandfather was somebody. And without evidence, documentary evidence, that they are constitutionally and legally entitled to Guyanese citizenship. Nobody can get, nobody can get Guyanese citizenship unless they're able to demonstrate that on the basis of documentary evidence provided. Thirdly, you mentioned social media or some video that you're watching. Let, let me also say that, you know, in today's era of connectivity, cyber use, the use of cyberspace for misinformation, for pedal, sowing the seeds of fear, for sowing the seeds of doubt, for sowing the seeds of disunity, that's actually an instrument of cyber warfare. And so you have all sorts of videos being floating around on social media. Some are completely fake. Some are dated. Some, in fact, don't, don't even relate to Guyana and to Venezuela. They come from some other part of the world. Some are photoshopped or otherwise altered. And so you know, I think everybody on this call knows that we, any one of us would, be, would find ourselves in an extremely absurd situation if we started believing everything that we see on social media. Social media has its benefits and advantages, tremendous though they might be, but it also has its shortcomings. Um, and so I want to say quite definitively that we have confidence in the men and women of the security forces for obvious reasons. And I know that this question has come up previously. I think Mr. Barnwell asked it previously. For obvious reasons, matters of defense and defense preparedness whether they concern our domestic defense forces or our partners, they are not matters that any responsible government will speak about loosely in a public domain. And I'm sure that you, that all of the participants in this call understand that fully. I'll stop there because I know others want, I see a number of raised hands as well. But thank you very much, Mr. Dalton, for participating. All right, thank you very much, Minister. Uh, Mr. Andrew, Mr. Andrew Taylor, you may proceed, sir. Ouch. You're muted, Mr. Taylor. Uh, yes. On the point of time, can I? Moderator, are you disregarding the, the questions posed in the chat? No, not as yet. We want to get rid of the, we want the persons who are putting up their hands and then we will get to them at the end of it all. That's the format we have kept on all of our programs. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Taylor, please can you, and, and again, please, we're asking you to respect 
uh, the, the presenters as well as the person asking the question, let that interface be between the presenter and the questioner. So we don't have persons uh, trying to insert more into it. It's going to cause some confusion in the question and answer segment. We're trying to stay clear of that. Mr. Taylor, please proceed with your question, sir. I just want to be very brief. It's a very concern of mine that I only learned of this border controversy in 1980 or I should say maybe a little earlier than that because I used to work at the University of Ghana Library and the Caribbean Research Library had housed at the time all the documents to do with this controversy. My concern is though, why aren't we making it an essential part of the school curriculum? Because to make your citizens fully aware of what belongs to them, God forbid, we live in such ignorance as I, I can only say that it's only because of this coming up, a lot of people are not aware that Ghana and Venezuela has a controversy and each citizen is a very important, has a very important part to play in it. Even knowledge, you know, knowledge is, is power. And if we are, the two thirds of your citizens are not aware of it, how best could you otherwise equip them to be ready to fight to defend what belongs to them? Not, last minute, you know, it, it's not good to me. I think we need to make an essential part of the school curriculum up to university if necessary. All, all geography classes should always, you should be instilling it in our kids that this is our situation and we need to defend it. We start doing it from a young age. We will have a stronger and a more unified force to face Venezuela if they continue with the, with, with the, with the foolishness. All right, thank you for your question, Mr. Taylor. Thank you, Mr. Taylor. I, I fully agree with you that Guyanese need to be educated on the issue. And um, perhaps it's a, it's a great suggestion to consider for sure. And that is why we are holding all of these sessions. And we hope that these public awareness and sensitization sessions can result in a more uh, concretized and perhaps have all of this knowledge be placed in academically in paper so that we would be able to utilize them in the future. But it's definitely a great suggestion. It is our history, but just to correct you on one thing, Guyana is not in a controversy, to, so to speak. Venezuela has an allegation and they believe themselves to be in a controversy over our land. But Guyana believes that we had a valid arbitral award given and we believe that our demarcation of our boundaries is what is Guyana, and it forms the all 83,000 square miles of Guyana. But I agree with you that we should make our history of how our country came about and our boundaries came about as a part of our curriculum, perhaps, and, and educate our young ones so that as they get older, they, are, they can do the same for the younger generation, and we understand fully how Guyana became Guyana. Uh, that was a mistake of mine. I don't mean I'm just talking about a controversy, but I know Ghana's position is is a hundred percent absolutely clear, and uh, they're just playing political games. And we need to we need to strengthen our people knowledge wise from within, so to speak, inculcating them the fact that this is our land, and by no means if we are not here, they have to carry on. They are fully equipped from within to fight if they have to fight. And and we agree with you. We agree with you. And uh, and I think that's why, of course, we are in this whole consultative and, and sensitization session where we can interact with you so that we can understand this very well. And you can also understand from our point of view what um, what are the facts and the position that Guyana is in. Thank you so much. Thank uh, you. Same. Uh, we'll ask Mr. Mike B. I'm sorry, that's all I'm seeing on the screen. Mr. Mike, you may ask your question, sir. Hi, good evening. Um, this is uh, Mike here. Greetings to you all, Rosalind and the host. Thank you guys so much for a very um, informative and eloquent uh, presentation tonight and all the interesting questions that follow. I just needed... Hello? Yes, we're hearing you. you. Hear Go me? ahead. Yes, we can. Go ahead. Right. So I would like... Um, I'd like Dr. Ashley say, or Sonia to um, clear up the air on this matter here. We're, I think there are a lot of mixed messages, especially talking to some folks in the diaspora here regarding what 
what's the power of the Geneva Agreement versus the arbitral award. So it seems like this, this is based on the propaganda of the Venezuelans that the belief of the 1966 Geneva, Geneva Agreement reopens the 1899 arbitral award and paves the way for renegotiation. Some people think that, right? My personal understanding is that the Geneva Agreement was arrived at to address the Venezuelan concern in 1966 of the content of a letter and the rest, that there was a compromise from the deal between the British and the American arbitrators at that time. Now, my question I want to pose out there, and if I'm Dr. Singh, Dr. Ashton Singh, so you can add some clarity to this to clear this up among, you know, I spoke to diasporans here, and um, that does the 1966 Geneva Agreement supersedes the 1899 arbitral award to override the boundary demarcation or reopen negotiations, or does it validate their rejection of the current boundary? And I would end there, you know, I know that a lot of people probably are waiting with their hands up, getting tired by now, but I also want to say that, you know, I believe and I trust in our um, military force to defend Guyana. Guyana is united right now. We should keep it this way. And to remind the previous caller that I think that our military is more motivated now since 2020, they have gotten back their bonuses and everything and they're being looked after. So I'd end here and I'd ask um, if Dr. Singh or Sonia can chime in here. Thanks a lot. Sure. So let me, let me, let me, take, this, let me take this one. Um, and it's, 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 thank you very much, uh, Mike, for that question. So it's, it's, it's a very good question. You, 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 the short answer is no. The 1966 Geneva Agreement does not replace, supersede, or otherwise uh, uh, repudiate the 1899 Arbitral Award. What, in fact, happened was, as Guyana was approaching independence, Venezuela raised this question on the basis of this mysterious memorandum that uh, Male Provost was alleged to have written. And as a result of Venezuela introducing controversy into this matter, or this Venezuelan manufactured and imagined controversy, Guyana, like I said, was approaching independence. The governments of the United Kingdom, Venezuela, and British Guyana, as, it, as we then were, concluded this Geneva Agreement in February 1966, to be precise. And all that the Geneva Agreement sought to do was to establish a binding and effective mechanism to achieve a permanent resolution of the controversy so it sought only to resolve the controversy that arose from Venezuela's efforts to repudiate the 1899 award. It did not call into question the 1899 award. It did not say anything that cast any doubt on the 1899 award. It, except, it, it simply acknowledged that Venezuela had introduced a position that caused controversy and it sought a binding mechanism to achieve the resolution of that controversy. Now, obviously, in an ideal world, the 1899 award would simply have, have stood and everybody would have continued to respect the boundary. Venezuela, having raised this matter in the 1960s, the Geneva Agreement was concluded. Now, one can very well debate, and I suspect you know that there's a debate about whether the Geneva Agreement should have been entered into or not. I'm sure from, I mean, you saw, from, from the formulation of your question, it's clear to me that you're very well informed on this matter. And so you're probably aware that there is a debate about whether the Geneva Agreement should have been concluded or not. Be that as it may, the Gen uh, we will say definitively, and this has been the consistent legal advice, and it has been the consistent position of successive Guyanese governments, the Geneva Agreement does not in any way repudiate the 1899 Arbitral Award. The 1899 Arbitral Award still stands as the authoritative award intended, as was indicated even going back to 1897, 1897 in the Washington Treaty, intended to be the full, final, and perfect settlement. So the short answer is no. 
Um, but like I said, I suspect that you're well aware of the debate surrounding uh, Geneva 1960. And thank you very much for your other comments. Great. Thank you very much. I, thank did you, I um, Dr. Singh. Thank you so much. That was very uh, precise there. And I just want to say that we will overcome this. This will pass. Like in 1982, I remember teaching in Guyana at that time. It is was the same. I was forced to buy defense bonds at that time to defend Guyana, and um, it just passed. So I want Ghanaians to remain yeah. optimistic and stand proud here. We will overcome this. It is going to pass. I strongly believe it's a bluff, but we got to leave nothing unturned. But I want to thank you guys for educating the diaspora tonight. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Mike. Thanks. Thank you. I saw one other hand. Did that person put their hand down? Because I'm going to go now to the questions that we had on the chat box. So the first question is, um, and I'm going to, this one's going to be an open one. Are you as military personnel on the ground in Guyana? Uh, so, so I stated before that, um, that just yesterday, I believe, or the day before, there was some social media art and, and articles in the newspaper that carried the various um, media sites and even our national our national media also carried that the United States, a troop from the United States were here in collaboration with the Guyana Defense Force working in, in tandem with them to of in relation to training. So I don't believe that that is a secret, but it's out there in the public. Okay, thank you so much, Minister. Uh, Mr. James Burke, your hand is up. Go ahead with your question, sir. Uh, good evening, everyone. Just a really quick question. Uh, Dr. Singh, you mentioned that greed uh, was one of the motivations for the Venezuelan, uh, the current Venezuelan and possibly previous Venezuelan aggression, aggressive moves. Can you comment just briefly on other motivations that might be at play, for instance, the domestic politics that um, surely is playing a role now and maybe in the 80s and maybe in the 60s also, just, just real briefly. So so uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, James, for, for that question. I, I'm not sure that, that the word greed was used by me, but I might have used diff a different formulation. Um, you are here again you're absolutely correct that i mean clearly venezuela is a valuable asset so whether we call it greed or whatever other label we attach to it that clearly is one motivation but you are absolutely correct that there are of course there are of course a number of other evident motivations and maybe some not so evident you mentioned one yourself Domestic politics and distraction and diversion from the domestic realities in Venezuela. We, I alluded earlier to the fact that Venezuela has a vast endowment of natural resources, including in particular oil, that has today not redounded to the benefit of the Venezuelan people. You have seen the economic challenges that has been faced by them, tragically by the Venezuelan people. As a result of gross mismanagement, we have seen, we have seen the whole world has seen, has been looking on and see, has seen those uh, images and those pictures. And so the reality is that the current political leadership in Venezuela is facing a very challenging domestic political environment. And without a doubt, reigniting and indeed escalating because a number of people have asked in previous questions well why now or what is peculiar about now one factor that emerged in our previous discussions is of course the emergence of oil but another very compelling response to the question about why now is the domestic political reality in venezuela and the need for either a distraction a diversion or an issue that could potentially um, uh, engage the attention of the Venezuelan people instead of the very challenging domestic circumstances they face. 
So you, you're, you're, you're correct. That's certainly uh, another motivation. And I think you, no doubt, merely from asking the question, I think you're clearly well aware and probably of the same view. They're clearly well aware of this potential uh, motivation. And, and like I said, probably of the same view. Um, so you're right. I agree with you. And I think we've said as much publicly previously and elsewhere. Too. All right. Thank you very much. I'm seeing a hand up. Um, unfortunately, I don't have a name. It just says iPhone. Yes, that would be you, sir. Go on. Okay. Um, I'm Stan. Um, I've yes, been on how are you doing? Good, good. I've been on some of these forums before. Mm -hmm. And um, for everybody's information, um, I'm Guyanese by marriage, actually. Um, and forever as a youth back home in Jamaica, I was very conversant with Guyanese politics and activities and so on and so forth. I stay abreast of things even today and regularly so. Now, my thinking is that while the historical and other situations that pertain to this, these issues that are being faced right now has to be dealt with at some level, my suggestion and thinking is that there perhaps needs to be a satisfaction level among Guyanese people within and without Guyana, whereby they can feel relevance to the opportunities and to the circumstances and to the um, just the, what the day offers. And I believe to the extent that that becomes possible, the enthusiasm felt by the Guyanese people generally would be nothing that needs to be campaigned for, et cetera, et cetera. But I also want to suggest that I believe policy probably in implemented would create a groundswell of, of, of support in Guyana itself for what has already been described as its historical vested and indisputable, indisputable um, claims and assertions. And I would want to think that if somebody among the speakers is able to suggest um, what moves are being made to create this sort of atmosphere in Guyana, whereby everybody becomes euphoric about um, the thrust and the emphasis that Guyana is now placing as a consequence of these, um, let's say, I want to call it assault or intended assault. Then I'm done. Thank you so much for the question. All right, anyone wants to add any comment or we will want to Mr. Sumner. So do you want to take that one or do you want me to take it? I'm not clear on a lot of things that he would have said, but I think he's asking about the consequences of, or what is government doing to get the people to, uh, I don't want to use the word hyped up, but get the people to come together and make a big unified gesture in relation to this. Am I correct? Is that what you're asking? I think I think it, I think it's a it's a fair it's a fair way of dealing with the question. Okay, great. So um, what we all right. Oh yeah. So we, it's a fair we way of dealing with the question. Um, I'm suggesting that perhaps the the policies internally should be such or there should be plans to create internal policies so everybody feels a part of all concerns that are on the table at any given time. He's what is being done to do that? Wow. Okay. Sure. So, far, so first of all, uh, you want to take this? No, no, go ahead, go ahead. I'll, I'll come in after. I was I'll come going after. to say, first of all, it's a natural, normal reaction to be concerned in the face of threats and the face of instability. And as a government, it's obvious that we have to lead very positively and we have to lead in a direction where our people are protected and where our borders are protected and our sovereignty is protected. 
And what we have been doing is not just awareness and sensitization, but if we're talking about in the most recent week uh, or, or leading up to the third, we have a number of activities planned. And this is not in relation to just a portion or a category of persons in Guyana. This is encompassing the entire Guyanese citizenship, whether you're at home or whether you are in the diaspora. And what we have been planning to do is a number of activities in relation to showing our unified position, our solidarity, as well as our stand on peace and diplomacy. So that is what we're going to be doing in relation to this issue. That those are the physical activities that we're going to be doing. And all of these activities are necess would necessarily include all Guyanese. All Guyanese will be participating. So there is no category that's left out. But that's in relation specifically to this issue. Sure. So, so if I if I may uh, if I may come in because I recognize, sir, that your question, while it um, is offered on the platform of this particular issue, I recognize that it's cast a little bit more widely. Let me say that first of all, the the philosophical position that you articulate about all Guyanese people feeling more uh, associated with what is happening in Guyana currently um, and therefore being more committed to issues of national interest. That philosophical premise is, is, is of course, unchallengeable. It's unchallengeable. We couldn't agree with you more. And in fact, whether it be Guyana's national interests in relation to the Venezuela matter, or Guyana's national interests in relation to any other matter, our government's commitment is to ensure that we improve the well-being of all Guyanese. We have said so as a matter of political undertaking and commitment in the manifesto on the basis of which we went to the electorate of Guyana to ask them for their votes in 2020. And we have said so equally in the actions that we've taken since we've come into office. Implementing an array of policies that taken together are intended to improve the circumstances of well-being of every single Guyanese individual, every single Guyanese family, irrespective of where they live, irrespective of what work they do, irrespective of wh from where their ancestors would have come, irrespective of whether they worship and if they worship, how they worship. It is in fact for that reason a recognition of exactly what you just articulated. It is in fact for that reason that our president has adopted as a philosophical underpinning of his presidency the theme of one Guyana, emphasizing our oneness as a country, like I said, across ethnic, religious, regional, geographical, occupational, across every single potential divide, celebrating and highlighting our oneness, rather the things that bind us together, rather than the things real and imaginary that could potentially distinguish us from each other. So we couldn't agree with you more. In fact, what you have articulated is the very inspiration for us to reaffirm this philosophy of one Guyana, which of course builds on our national motto, one people, one nation, one destiny. And coming out of that and, you know, in keeping with and consistent with that, one Guyana, doesn't matter where your ancestors came from. It doesn't matter whether you worship or how you worship. It doesn't matter where you live, region one, region nine, region 10, region six, region four. We have a shared common interest. And as we navigate this particularly interesting and indeed exciting period in our country's history, 
it is now more important than at any other time. It has always been important. So maybe I should be careful about saying now more important than any other time. But it is important. It is of paramount importance that we navigate this period as one unified Guyana. Certainly in relation to the Venezuela-initiated controversy, but indeed in all other matters of national interest. So thank you very much for that observation, sir. Thank you so much, Minister. Mrs. Sumner, and after which we'll take two final questions from the chat box before we bring this to an end. Mrs. Sumner, proceed with your question, please. Thank you. Uh, my question sort of goes back. Um, in the discovery of the new world, um, there are ways in which the colonial powers acquired land and territory, exploration, um, discovery, conquest, and agreements. And so my question is, what is the exact basis upon which Venezuela is claiming the Essequibo as theirs? Is it by discovery? Is it by conquest? Is it by some kind of um, you know, military war that where they won or regained the territory? Or is it, did they purchase it? I have not seen any established documentation, any publication that they can take to any court, a fair court, and win this argument that they own this equipment. So that's the first one. The second one is randomly very brief, is we inherited this problem from the British. And I've seen, and I applaud the, the, the current government for most of the moves that they have made, including this outreach to that, the diaspora. But has there been any consideration of engaging the British to also conduct joint exercises in Guyana so that we can sort of deter Venezuela's apparent and obvious aggression. Thank you. Thank you for that. I appreciate the question. And you actually did ask two of the key questions I'm about to ask you that was in the chat box. So you saved me from some questions there. Thank you, Rich. I wasn't meaning to be impolite earlier. I was just saying it's unfair. Well, no, that's good. That's very good. You saved me from asking the same question. So that's good. But raising the hand gets the first question. But that's okay. Thank you. All right. So in relation to the second question that you asked, whether we've engaged the United Kingdom or, or England, the United Kingdom for, forms a part of the Commonwealth. And the Commonwealth has strongly condemned the actions of Venezuela very recently. Dr. Ashley Singh, he read out in detail and verbatim what was stated in that um, statement that they issued. And by just the mere fact of them supporting Guyana, we are grateful, but we are also engaging all of our all of the international community and all of the signatories to the treaties that and organizations that we are a part of. So it's not just the United States that we have spoken about, but it's also the Commonwealth, which consists of a number of countries in which um, Dr. Ashni Singh, I think he called each one of them, as well as CARICOM, as well as the OAS. So to answer your question, yes, they have been engaged. And we have held diaspora uh, sensitization sessions, such as this one with the United Kingdom as well. All right, thank you very much for that. All right, the final question will be from the chat. So, so may, I, may, I, may I, yeah, may I, may I, oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Can, can I come in? Sure. The first half of the question, that is, Mr. Sumner asked, uh, there was a first half to his question about the basis on which Venezuela is making this claim. And he referred, in fact, to the manner in which colonial powers, when they discovered the new world, as it was then described, um, how they went, went about claiming land, planting their flag on various pieces of land in the Americas. Um, and I'm glad that you raised that point, because, in fact, the boundary line that was eventually settled in 1899 didn't just come out of nowhere at all. In fact, a lot of previous work had been done. After the counties of Essequibo, Demerara, and Burbis were merged into what was then known as British Guyana, a lot of work was done to survey and lay out what would then be proposed as the boundary 
the boundary line between British Guyana and Venezuela. And you would in fact have heard of such uh, explorers as Robert Herman Schomburg. You may have heard of the Schomburg. Mr. Sumner clearly is uh, very widely read. You may have heard of the Schomburg line. And in fact, Robert Herman Schomburg was amongst the early colonial explorers sent by uh, the United Kingdom at the time, this is mid 19th century, now mid 1800s, to explore and lay out, to explore, survey, and lay out the boundary between British Guyana and Venezuela, as a result of which this, uh, amongst other things, the Schomburg line was laid out. And in its 1899 deliberation, the arbitral tribunal which comprised two members of the Supreme Court of the United States of America, two members of the Privy Council of the United Kingdom, and a fifth judge agreed upon, mutually agreed upon. The arbitral tribunal considered thousands of his pages of historic documents, including historic records of exploration, historic surveys, historic lines that had been drawn, and considered over 200 hours of oral testimony and came up with the boundary that the border that we now know to be the border between Guyana and Venezuela. And so you are, Mr. Sumner, you're, you hit the nail on the head that, I mean, you, you're right. I mean, in the old days, colonial powers came into the new world and planted a flag and claimed that land as theirs. But over time, and you are correct, you either acquire, in those days, you planted your flag and claimed a piece of land, or you bought it from somebody, or you engaged in, in you, you know, some exploration and discovered some new territory that you claimed or whatever. And you are, so you, you're absolutely correct. And what I wanted to say was that there was a historic context in which, or against which, or on the basis of which, the 1899 Arbitral Tribunal made the award and drew the boundary where they did. And you are furthermore absolutely correct that Venezuela has not produced a single shred or scintilla of evidence to demonstrate on what basis they are making this spurious and unsupportable claim. You're absolutely correct about that, Mr. Sumner. I'm glad that you gave me an opportunity to elaborate on that point. All right, thank you very much. Now, the final question that's in, that we're going to ask from the chat box, and just in case anybody feels that we have not answered a question, one of the things we've done throughout these some these sessions, because there are so many uh, questions and so many uh, that are in the chat box as well, we know, that's why we ask for your contact details. The questions will be answered and emailed to you um, in the interest of saving time and also to get your questions answered. The final question we're going to ask for tonight is relates apparently to the ruling tomorrow. It says, what is Guyana's expectation for the ICJ ruling tomorrow? Hmm. Uh, we're expecting that since we've had, a very, we've presented a very strong case to the ICJ in the substantive matter. And given that we have followed all of the principles of international law, as well as diplomacy, and we continue to do that, that our the provisional measures that we've approached the court for would be granted. That is our hope, that is our um, expectation. And um, again, we, in the very, in the very recent weeks, and, and maybe for decades, for a few decades now, uh, Venezuela's aggression has increased. Um, its intimidation tactics have increased. And Guyana being a very peace-loving nation, we're not going to go on a defense of provocation. We are going to go where we're supposed to rightfully go, which is the International Court of Justice, which we have done. And these provisional measures, of course, I think someone was asking before, what are the provisional measures that we're asking for? And Guyana has requested that the court indicate, well, we have asked for provisional measures against Venezuela to prevent her from taking any of the actions that would be called for by the referendum, especially the creation of a new Venezuelan state uh, consisting of Guyana's Essequibo region and incorporating it in the Venezuelan territory. But more importantly, 
to stop Venezuela from aggressively approaching Guyana. Very well, thank you so much. So again, I'm going to state, unfortunately, we cannot take more questions. And yesterday, even at all of our forums, particularly when we got down to the end, we saw some hands coming up and some other questions in the chat box. But out of respect for time and everybody's uh, the length of time everybody would have stayed here, we are asking you to put the questions in the chat box. We will search and a contact uh, email address uh, or a phone number, and we will certainly get back to you with the answer and we'll share with you uh, critical information videos on this here so you can have that information um, at your disposal at any point in time. Ministers, quickly, we'll take some final closing re uh, remarks from you and then we'll bring the curtain down to an end. All right. Well, thank you, Rosalinda. Thank you, everyone, for your questions and for being present here with us this evening. And of course, those who are viewing the live. Uh, we want to reassure you that government is doing everything that it possibly has to do to protect our borders and our people. And we remain a peaceful nation. We will always take the diplomatic route. We will always take the peaceful route. And we implore you and urge you not to listen to narratives that will create fear mongering in communities or to even be a part of those narratives yourselves. Because the last thing that we want is a state that is panicked, a state that is in a, already in a mental state of confusion. Because I want to thank our Guyana Defense Force, our armed forces, and our people as a whole, because this is an issue that is not political. This is not an issue that is only with the PPP or the PNC. This is something that affects us nationally. It, is affect, it affects all Guyanese, and I have seen us Guyanese from irrespective of the political divide, irrespective of the regional geographical divide. All Everyone has come out in solidarity, in unity on this issue. Guyana has one position on this issue. Esequibo belongs to us, and that we are going to remain, we are going to do everything that is legitimate we are going to follow the rule of law. We are going to follow democracy, the principles upon which our country is built, upon, built on. And we, again, ask you not to buy into just any source of information that is out there on social media or, in, uh, or otherwise that creates a, a narrative that is potential, that has a potential of creating confusion and fear. We don't want that at all. We what we want you to know is that we are doing everything, every single thing possible to protect our country, your country. Thank and you very much. We will Sorry. continue to do so. Thank you. Minister Singh. So thank you very much, Rosalinda. I will simply um associate myself with all of the closing remarks that Minister Parag just uh, articulated and only add. So my dear Guyanese brothers and sisters who joined us today, thank you very much for taking the time to join us. Thank you very much for your continued interest in Guyana. And thank you very much for your continued commitment to Guyana. Thank you very much and good evening or good afternoon, depending on where you are in the world. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. So I want to say to both ministers, thank you very much for taking time off from your busy schedule to be here. I know that both of you are incredibly maxed out. I've seen the, the flurry of activities for the past week. Everywhere you turn, uh, ministers and officials are literally engaging people all over your one day in the media, next year in the radio, you're in another group talking. I was sure I saw Minister Singh in some part of this country today with handing out solar panels. I'm not sure how he's back here in the office there. So th th that's that's quite incredible. So we want to thank you very much. We appreciate the time you've doing you're, you've spent with us here. And to our Guyanese diaspora in across the several states that are here. The reason why we've done this and the reason why we've put all of you together, because we understand how much you care for the country. The diaspora unit was set up to serve the interests of the, of the Guyanese diaspora. And education is one part of it there. We have developed excellent relationship with all well, a lot of the Guyanese we've come into contact with from across all of these states that are represented here tonight, one way or the other, by various individuals on the forum. And we've had multiple um virtual platforms and um, discussions on 
a lot of matters as it relates to investments, uh, any issue that they want to have, we are more than happy to put together any forum, any discussion, and we bring the highest officials to share that information with you so that you have official information coming up. This is no different in the case of the Guyana-Venezuela border controversy. And I learned something tonight that for Guyana, we consider this settled. Unfortunately, we still have to go through the process of stating why we consider this settled, basically, and you know, try to, again, to tell people what was already established since 1899, which is most unfortunate. One of the things I in part in, I want I, quickly that I wanted to say to you, social right now for Guyana, it is a sensitive period, basically. And I, I endorse what the minister said, that psychological warfare is a serious matter. Our job here as a fisher, more so, I would say, the minister's position is perhaps a little bit more tougher, uh, is tougher than others in that you have to keep your people there calm and, and keep them with the facts all the time. Yesterday, I was at, uh, was at a forum. And you know what was what popped up on my phone? A, a, so a Twitter feed that says, breaking news, Guyana and Venezuela is fighting at the border. And they literally had soldiers canvassing through the jungle, basically. Turned out to be fake news absolute fake news basically but the thing about it these are the things we have to safeguard our people with and when i listen to a lot of the comments and some of the questions here you i've seen where the genesis of this is coming from but unfortunately this forum does not give us the length of time to go through all of that and i hope that when you put your details we can engage off the this call and in other forums a little more details into some of the things that were expressed here and to show you what is and what is not the government has made it clear it is not engaging in this matter with any politics because this is a, a matter for all Guyanese. So we don't want anyone to walk away from this forum uh, with any idea that there's any politics involved in this, anything to do with race, color, creed, nothing of the sort. This is a matter of national sovereignty and everyone is is, is um, united on it. We encourage the diaspora to continue to be supportive of what we have here. Persons have asked us in previous calls, how can the diaspora play a role in all of this here? We're like, you can talk to your, your senators, your Congress people, and tell them what's updating and what's going on here and how much their support also is needed here. We are a small country, but we are very big in our courage and in our in how we inspire our people to face the Goliaths that we often see ever so often, no less than the one that we're facing today. So we want to leave this part in words with you. Again, we've put our contact details in the chat box. We want you to put yours inside there so we can continue to engage you with information off of this call. Thank you so much for being here. We really, really appreciate you. Uh, we are more than happy to share information with you. And we're going to have some digital flyers uh, subsequently that we're going to share that outlines the history of all of this here. So every information you would have gotten is not generated from social media personnel or influencers or people docu um, uh, putting uh, fake videos together. Uh, these are all official information that we're going to be sending to you. And we want you to, to know that 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 position and and share that position as well so again thank you so much ministers thank you so much everyone from from the u.s there we really appreciate you have a lovely night god bless you take care i'm gonna leave the chat open for a bit